Some songs that are just captured in essence, I think, of Paul, the Bible expresses. I don't believe there's a one of us that hasn't had to wrestle with the concept that song declares. That is, we began in such a high fashioned way that we're going to be all of us and none of God, and finally, as the truth of God has its way in our lives, we finally come down to the humble position we all occupied from the beginning, and that is, none of self and all of me. I've heard of a song leader, I suppose, humorously, I don't know how he would try to do such a thing, or why he would do such a thing, who led one verse of that song, the first verse. And uh, I think I would just have to ask, wait a minute, you're not through yet. No, don't stop there. Because surely that wouldn't be the way we want to stop and think of ourselves. That would be all of self and none of me and just go home. That's not the way it all works. Sometimes we hear about people, of course, that have that kind of attitude. And I read about brethren who say that gospel meetings are not worth anything anymore. And that the day, the day of gospel meetings are over. I've heard that, I suppose, practically all the time I've been preaching. Every time somebody made the gospel during a meeting, when you have having concentrated efforts, times and opportunities when people can't come that they might not otherwise come, that I'm reminded again of how the power of God can work in the ways that we use to serve Him. Last evening, <coughs> Mr. Scroggins and I had some good studies after the service was over. We studied about 11.30. Individuals can come to the meetings like this and give the gospel preached and then study together. And Those are always good ways of bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to the people's lives. I commend this church for your effort throughout the week. It's been a joy to be with you. You've received me so very well in your home. You've made me feel uh, very welcome in your midst, and I appreciate it so very much. I want to talk with you tonight about the subject and the idea of restoration. I'm not at all in favor of what some have called a restoration movement. As far as movements are concerned, I, I don't want to get caught up in a movement. Movements tend to be sectarian. They tend to encapsulate an idea and sometimes emphasize one idea uh, that would leave other ideas just as important, unsaid. But I do believe that there's a concept that the Bible describes as a restoration concept that is worthy of our consideration. I believe that some of the greatest things that you'll ever read about would be the planning of God for the nation. And the fact that God was going to do this through the Jews, and with the calling of Abraham, he made the promises to Abraham, uh, the three promises that we're so very much familiar. And as he made those promises to Abraham, we're very much aware that those, those promises to Abraham were not simply something looking out in the future to establishing some kind of a political state. But rather, the promises made to Abraham were in fact made with a view to saving people. Salvation was to be coming through the seed of Abraham. And all the promises with regard to Abraham and the nation of the Jews was to bring them a sign in the world. Look of Galatians, Paul said that in the fullest of time, God, God brought forth uh, through Mary the child Jesus, and we therefore have salvation through Jesus Christ. Go back and read all the various things that God did through those times, and you're thrilled, surely, to read about God working. His miraculous power to bring about the promises, the providence of God as He moved to bring His purpose uh, to fruition. And all those things are certainly, indeed, very thrilling to all of us, and yet, at the same time, recognize that it is in the heart of man oftentimes to go astray. I know about this in me, I've times that I've done things that I wish I hadn't done. And we tend to go astray at times. And we find the people of God in the Old Testament and in the New Testament going astray. And very clearly does the Bible teach that one of the failures of all of us is that we go away, we tend to go away from God's pattern of things. Most of you have heard, of course, of Brother J.D. Tan, who lived a generation ago, whose favorite expression was, Brethren, we are drifting. Uh, Brother Tan, of course, we have long enough to see some of those things come to completion of what he was warning about. And they have come full cycle. And truly, we have drifted in many ways. The Bible warns about those things that we would drift away from God. In the Hebrew letter, in chapter 2 and verse 1, the writer there speaks of this business of drifting away. When he said, beginning in verse 1, therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest we drift away. For the word spoken to angels through steadfast. 
In every transgression and disobedience receive the just reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord was confirmed to us by those who heard him. Here the apostle is warned to get this business of drifting away. And then we know in 2 Peter chapter 3 that Peter also warned about the same process that takes place in 2 Peter chapter 3. And verse 17 he says, You therefore, beloved, since you know these things beforehand, beware that you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him is the glory both now and forever. Amen. <coughs> both the Apostle here and the Apostle Peter and others have talked about the fact that we would tempt to fall away. Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4, 1 Timothy chapter 4 warns of these things. We need to recognize that the Apostle did not speak simply from the standpoint of filling up pages. But as the Apostle Paul said, the Spirit said expressly, that is pointedly, that these things were going to happen. I believe sometimes that we somehow disconnect ourselves from the Bible and don't really understand sometimes how those things are directed toward human nature. I recognize that the Bible is written to those people, but I believe the Bible is written for us. And thus the things that were spoken of back in those days, as they happened to them, will surely happen to us again. You can see the cycles in the scriptures. You can see the cycles in human nature. You can see the cycles in the church. Even as you can see in the cycles in the old Jewish nation, how they fell away time and again. I believe we ought to continue to study those things and recognize that there's always a danger about happening to us. I believe most of us can recognize that most of us can see around us trends and things that are being practiced and taught that are not healthy, as the Bible uses the word healthy. They're not sound in the way that would cause the church to be built up. We talked earlier in the week about the fact that when some churches, well, I think we were talking privately to someone about this, that many times churches would write into their deeds restricted clauses. They would have a restricted deed written into a clause, into the restricted clause written into the deed that says that as long as the Church of Christ meets in this building, you cannot have an instrument of music in the public worship. There are some that say as long as uh, the church meets in this building, you cannot have. A, uh, a kitchen built in this building. And various kinds of restricted clauses have been written into the deeds uh, owned by the churches. And I don't know that I think that's wrong. Uh, in scriptural, I just think it's ineffective. I don't believe that you can ever really keep a church sound in the faith by restricted clauses and deeds of property. You can write a restricted clause, someone else can take it out. That's just the way that it goes. And many times those things have happened where the restricted clauses have maybe been violated, but the very thing which the ones who wrote that sought to avoid end up being practiced in the very building uh, where they thought it would never happen because of that restricted clause. And all I'm saying is that if we want to keep the church of Jesus Christ sound in the faith, it has to be because every one of us has a particular attitude toward the Word of God. What's going to happen to this church in 15 years? What's going to happen to it in 20 years, 25 years? What will we preach from this pulpit if this pulpit is still here at that time? Who's going to be preaching the pulpit in 25 years? What's going to be done in 25 years? We'd like to think that the same sound gospel that Brother Scroggins is preaching when we preach then. But how can you be sure about those things? I believe the only thing to recognize is that we have to have the kind of attitude that keeps coming back to our roots. Coming back to understand exactly what it is the Bible teaches to love the Word of God and to do those things. I want to go back with you tonight to the Old Testament for the major part of the lesson because I think this is taught so eloquently and adequately as it describes the process that took place in the Old Testament of people drifting away from God and the process of restoring the people of God. Those things are not disconnected to us tonight. We need to recognize that the same pressures and the same ideals that Satan put forth in the Old Testament are present with maybe new words but the same ideas among God's people today. It'd be foolish indeed if we thought that we can set in motion a series of events that will always stay exactly the way that it ought to be. The devil is going to see to it that doesn't happen. We have to continue working and striving to see that the Church of Jesus Christ remains faithful to the Gospel of Jesus Christ and I believe that every generation 
Every generation, we have to re-examine everything that we are doing and see whether or not we're doing in the light of what God would have us to do. A few years ago, I think about 10 years, some eldership out in Kentucky called for what they call a, a nationwide gathering of all the elders. And what they proposed was that all the elders in the Church of Christ come together in Kentucky and we're going to have a meeting and settle all the issues. We'll never again be bothered by marriage, divorce, and marriage. We're never again going to be bothered by institutionalism. We're never again going to be bothered about the war question. We're never again going to be bothered about the covering question. We're not going to be bothered about any questions because this group of elders they propose is going to meet together and settle the issues. They were going to have a decision reached on what we were going to believe and practice as far as the churches of Christ were concerned. Well, of course, there was a howl from brethren who just were horrified that anybody would have that shallow concept of elders or that shallow concept of the Word of God, and that never materialized. I don't know that the people who promoted it ever changed their minds about it, but it never materialized. But I do believe it's possible to get together tonight and have a vote and decide what the churches of Christ of America, all the world, are going to do. We're not going to be able to have any kind of restricted clause written into the property uh, of, this, of this church that says so long as this church stands that you'll never do this or this or this or this and have the assurance that's going to stand. And the only thing you really can do is simply say we've got to get back every generation to the Word of God. And I hear sometimes people sort of have the idea, well, you know, we shouldn't study instrument of music. We, couldn't, we shouldn't study uh, the role of elders and we shouldn't study the time of salvation because we've been all that through that before. <coughs> Rather, don't you not realize that in every congregation that's growing, there are always different levels of understanding. In a congregation that's growing, you're always going to have babies in Christ. In a church that's growing, you're going to have people that are in the process of maturing and developing who maybe never studied uh, proper worship as they should have or for the first time they've been exposed to it. And you cannot say on any given subject, we'll never have to preach on that again. When Calvinism and uh, some of the things that were brought up by Calvinism came into the church. Brother Elmer Moore was preaching, and I don't recall the name of the place where he was preaching at the time. So he brought a lesson on Calvinism, and one of the brethren took him off the side and saw the sound of his family and said, Brother Moore, you're wasting my time. I've heard all that before. We're not bothered by that here, and you're wasting my time. I, I, I just regret that you wasted the time the whole church to deal with Calvinism because. We, we're not bothered with that. The next Sunday, there was a man in the audience that was looking for a place to move. He was in the church there and worshiped with them, thinking about moving to that town. He later on moved to Houston. But he was there looking for a place to move, and the one who was the chief advocate of all the problems that came into the Church of Christ in Texas on Calvinism was thinking about settling in that church. Point of it is that you never get to the point where you don't have to keep discussing things because you don't know what the future is going to hold, and these things do indeed go by cycles, and you always have someone that needs to study these things over and over again. I hope that you realize that is what I'm saying may be somewhat superfluous. But I know sometimes these things need to be said because we get the concept that things are always going to be set of course, and they'll never veer from that course. Most of us, I think, have been thrilled. When we watch the amount of technology that goes into the space shops, I know that I have. The idea that men are so smart, they can put uh, instruments in the space that go from here to there, and they hit the spot where they're aimed. But from what I can read, and I only know what I can read, I'm not an engineer, I understand that when someone puts a space shot out, that the engineers who are controlling that have to change the direction of those space shots occasionally and update the material and information that's going into the computers because of gravity pull or because of thrust or because of one thing or another, that space shot will suddenly be a little bit off target. And what you have to do is pull that back to target, pull it back in the direction that you intend for it to go because it tends to drift for one reason or another. And I'm persuaded that's exactly the way it is with, with God's people. Occasionally because of the way the world pulls us, or sometimes because of bad information being fed into the brains of us, we begin to veer off, we begin to sort of drift away. We've got to go back and touch base occasionally with the Word of God and try to find out if we're really doing what it is that we ought to be doing. 
We can never get to the point where we can say, well, I've never preached another sermon on baptism because we have plumbed the depths of baptism and no one will ever need to know about baptism anymore. We'll never get to the point where we can say, well, I don't have to preach on instrumental music anymore or public worship anymore because this church has heard all that there is to hear. Because the very next service there will be somebody in the church who doesn't understand those things and needs the very kind of teaching. If we get to the point, brethren, where we are so aloof and cynical that I think I know it all and that I don't need to hear these things again, I suggest to you that in itself is dangerous. When you get to the point where you think, I've heard it all, I know it all, then my reply is, well, why aren't you teaching more? i found many times that the ones who are the most cynical about having heard it all are the ones who do the least. And I'm not pointing fingers at anybody in the church because I don't know you rather than here in the church well enough to do that. But I'm saying from the experience that I've seen, I've seen those who somewhat get a self-righteous attitude, those who get somewhat of a cynical attitude about things. I know it all. I've heard it all before. I'm being bored by this. Why don't you move on to something else? And the very thing that may bore you, and the very thing that may turn you off, might be the very thing somebody needs in the audience to save their soul from heaven. And we need to be praying that the truth of the gospel will have free course in the minds and hearts of people who are babes in Christ, as well as those who are the most mature children of God. And I've witnessed something through the years in preaching. I've witnessed that many times those who become bored and those who become cynical are the ones who are least able to be servants in the kingdom of Christ. On the other hand, I've seen individuals who study the Bible a lot longer than I have. And as the years go by and as they study more, the Bible just gets more dear to them. Preaching, they love it more. They love the Bible more. And there's a, there's a pull and an attraction of people who just love the Lord. And they're always hungry for the gospel. Let's pray that we always stay hungry for the gospel. Now, I've deviated somewhat from the lesson, but I won't get back to it. The idea, of course, in the Old Testament, when God gave the promises to Abraham and began to pull the people of God into the nation of the Jews to bring about bringing Christ into the world. <coughs> They began to drift. They began to fall away. The promises that God had made to them was that if you will keep my law, I'll give you the land and you'll be secure in that land. But he also made another promise. That is, if you fall away from my law, I'll take you out of that land. And God kept both promises. He gave them the land of Canaan, the promised land. And then because of their sins, he took them away to captivity. In Jeremiah chapter 15 and verse 1. Jeremiah said, or God do Jeremiah said, if Moses and Samuel, in effect, both stood before me pleading for you, I wouldn't listen to them. I'm going to take you out of the land. They'd gone into idolatry, they'd gone into sin, they'd gone into immorality, and God said, I'm going to punish you by taking you off into the land of captivity. After they had been there for a period of time, God then saw that they repented and brought them back into the land. If you remember your history. Assyria took Israel into captivity about 721, 722 B.C. A little bit later, Judah was taken captive by Babylon about 606 B.C. Then after they'd been in captivity for 30 years under Babylon, Persia under Cyrus allowed the Jews to come back into the land of Canaan about 536 B.C. And then in 457 B.C., Ezra led some more back into the land of uh, the Canaan. And finally, Nehemiah also came back and did some work. And so Ezra and Nehemiah are very important to our study tonight because both of these were men who came back to Jerusalem after the people had come out of captivity. Now try to imagine what they'd been through. They'd been through, as far as Israel's concerned, well over a hundred years in captivity. But Judah had been in captivity for 70 years. And so a great number of years had been in captivity. And the point of all that was that God was punishing them so they could be restored to God's fellowship. So they could learn the lesson and not be idolaters anymore. When they came back then and began to build up the temple and began to practice after the law, you think, well, they've learned it. Now they're not going to do those things anymore. But by the time Ezra came back into the land in about 457, 58 AD, B.C., the people had already again began to go back into apostasy. 
And what Ezra found was that the people had already apostatized again. That is, they had already gone straight. He also found out that the worship had been corrupted. They were doing things they should not do with regard to violating the Sabbath day. And they'd gone back to their old immoral habits. And I'm quite sure that Ezra must have had the idea that we would have had, have you not learned anything? All this has happened to you, and all the captivity, and all the destruction of the temple that David built, that, that Solomon built, and all the various things that were done in the Old Testament. Have you not learned anything? And when Ezra came back into the land and came into the, among the people, he found the very same things being practiced that had caused God to punish them all over again. Now, if you take your books, your history books, and go back and read what we call the Restoration Movement in America, you have got to go back to the time of the camels and the stones and the various ones, James O'Kelly and others, and read the various things that these men 150 years ago tried to, tried to overcome and tried to get back to the ancient order of things. It's amazing that you'll find us in our generation doing the same things they tried to overcome. We're making the same mistake in our time that those people made that led them away from God in the first place. It's amazing if you go and look at the various books and debates that have, happened, that have taken place in our generation and compare them to a generation ago when the Christian church formed, you're going to find the exact same arguments being made in favor of those things all over again and the same arguments being made to dispute those things all over again. It's as though we haven't learned anything. Now, I know so far as this congregation is concerned, you may not be caught up in some of those practices. But I'm saying that the same tendency to drift is always here because this is Wednesday night. And because surely most of us are members of the church, I thought it would be a good idea to go back and look at some of the dangers that confronted us from the standpoint of drifting that we're talking about. But also look at Ezra from the standpoint of what he did to try to bring the people of God back to the brink of apostasy again. And not only suggest some answers that I believe are very clearly there, in order to help us learn not to do, again in our time, what people have done in the past. First of all, I want to say to you that Ezra expressed a great sorrow at what he saw. I believe that we ought to be able to be touched by some of the problems that we see around about us. I'm afraid sometimes that we can't be touched too, too much because we get to the point that we don't care. Brethren, we need to be people that have soft hearts with regard to the church and its problems. Whenever you see some member of the church that has gone astray, you need to be able to be touched by that brother or sister. Ye that are spiritual, Paul said in Galatians chapter 6, restore such a one who has been overcome in the trespass. We need to be able to feel sorrow at sin. We need to be able to understand that when the church has problems, I can't be content unless I'm involved in trying to find a solution for those problems. When Ezra came back to the land of Canaan and found those things going on that were true in his day, Ezra had a great deal of sorrow in his heart. I want to ask you to turn, please, to Ezra chapter 9. And it begins to talk about in chapter 9, verse 1, coming into the land and finding out what they're doing. He said in verse 2, For they've taken their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of the lands, Yea, the hand of the princes and rulers have been chief in this trespass. So all the people are going astray. Verse 3 says, And when I heard this thing, I rent my garment and my robe, my robe and plucked off the hair of my head and of my beard and sat down confounded. When Jesus was on the earth, he came into the temple. The Bible tells us that he saw the temple of God, the place where God had put his name. And those people had turned the house of God into a den of thieves. And the Bible says that Jesus took off his belt and made the cord out of it and beat those people out of the whole temple. Turned over the tables, threw out the, the money, and chased them out of the temple. And the disciples remembered what David had said, Zeal, the lighthouse, hath consumed thee. Do you ever feel sorrow when some member of the church feels astray? Have you ever shed tears on the loss of the soul? How long has it been since you've been so concerned about a brother and sister in Christ that's gone astray that you picked up a phone and called them? Or written them a letter, gone by the seat and tried to have a Bible study? Does it concern you that spiritual Zion, the church of God, is filled up with troubles today? 
I've read extensively, as both of you I'm sure has, about history and the history of God's people in our modern times. And I remember hearing and reading about the 40s, the 30s, the 40s, and 50s. And I remember reading about the fact that during the 40s you had the problem of premillennialism. I know during the 50s and some of the 40s there was a problem of always trying to get the church in the budget. And that was the beginning of liberalism. But you could get on a bus or some transportation to go from one side of this country to the other side of the country in that time and not really have to worry about where you worship. You could worship with any church of Christ practically in America and believe and practice the same thing. But I'm here to tell you that in my lifetime, I have never in all my life, the last 10 years, seen as many winds of doctrine going through the church as that are taking place in, in our time. You can scarcely find a congregation that's not bothered by some nudism. People have gone crazy after all kinds of things that make no sense whatsoever. And rather than having brethren worship together and be edified and grow together in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, churches are in trouble all over the land. Does that concern you? Does that bother you? How much are we going to be used to try to build up the cause of Christ rather than tear it down? I'm, I'm amazed at how many people think the way to build up the church and try to split a church somewhere. Churches are dividing and splitting all over this country because people are nutty. I'm telling you, I'm not exaggerating. People are nutty. If you talk about strange ideas, they'll pick up any kind of a nutty idea and, and suddenly latch on to it. And it becomes their pet hobby. They've got to come into the church with it and try to drive it in. And whether it's a vicious meeting, and I, to this day, to this day, I don't like business meetings. I believe they're essential. I don't know the way to get around them in the absence of elders. But every time we have a business meeting, and our business meetings at home are very pleasant. We haven't had any problems. In the nine years this church has gone, we've had problems, but we've all pulled together. But to this day, I dread business meetings. Because when I first started preaching, the business meetings were filled with rancor, animosity, and people fighting for one another. And that drilled into me a fear of that sort of thing that will let me to the day I die. I don't like business meetings. Not that they don't do good, and our, ours have done a lot of good at home. But the point is that there's always a danger that's in my mind that somebody is going to come in and try to tear the church up to a business meeting. And you see these sort of things happening. In our time, we've got all kinds of ideas that just are thrown out as, as though someone's found something new, something exciting, and all the world is. There's another way the devil tries to cause the people of God to go astray. We need to watch those things, and of course, the end result of that is it's how God and men who serve as elders. And we won't have to worry about that a lot anymore. But what, what Ezra saw caused him to have great sorrow. The Bible says that he rent his garment. And his robe is plucked off the hair of his head and his beard and sat down confounded. And I confess to you there are times when I can identify with what Ezra went through on that occasion. Not only that, but the Bible says that he also called together those who cared. Went on down in that same verse. Then were assembled to me everyone that trembled at the words of the God of Israel because of the trespass of them of the captivity. And I sat confounded until the evening of oblation. Ezra called together the people that came. The only people that got to ever solve the problem are the people that came. What concerns me is the fact that it's so difficult to find people today who care about things. I can talk to the brethren who know all the stories of the Dallas Cowboys for the last decade. I know brethren who know all the games of the orders and what they're going to, who they're going to play and when they're going to play. I know there are people who spend money and have a whole season ticket. But some of the base, the basketball game. And you couldn't get them to turn off the television set and have a Bible study if they're so dependent on it. And I think it does. We're so wrapped up with knowing about things. We're smart. American people are smart. And I'm impressed with the fact that at home we have engineers that are building planes and doing things that, that my mind couldn't even perceive doing. The L-16s and other kind of stealth bombers and things that are going on. I'm impressed with all that. And I don't have any real problem with people who are smart in a lot of ways. But if we get so smart that we don't care about God's word and God's word, then we're too smart. 
And it's difficult sometimes to find people who really to sit down and talk about the Bible and build up the cause of Christ. And what Ezra did to try to correct the situation he found was get the people together to care. Now I'm saying that because I think that I don't think tonight we're the people of this church to care. The ones that are coming together. And we need to be reminded of the fact that what we're trying to do is build up these things and make a better situation of what it is. But not only that, he confessed in prayer that things were not as they ought to be. And Daniel, or rather, uh, Ezra chapter 9, beginning with verse 5, and that the evening oblation I rolled from my humiliation, even with my garment, my robe went. And I fell upon my knees and spread out my hand to the Jehovah my God. And I said, O oh my God, I am ashamed and blush. Lift up my face to thee, my God. For our iniquities are increased over our head, and our guiltiness is grown up into the heavens. Since the days of our fathers, we've been exceeding guilty unto this day. And for our iniquities have we, our kings, our priests, been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, the captivity, the plunder, and the confusion of face, as it is at this day. And now for a little moment. Grace has been shown from Jehovah our God to leave us a remnant to escape, and to give us a nail in his holy place, that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. In the morning we're going to be studying from Daniel chapter 9, but I want to get... Just jump ahead a little bit to talk about the prayer that Daniel prays. When he finally, Daniel was one of those in the captivity. He lived at the end of the captivity in the sense that he recognized that the time had come for God to send the people back to their land. The people were still in captivity at the time of Daniel. Daniel was reading the scrolls. He ran across the promise of God that at the end of 70 years, I'm going to send my people back to their land once again. And Daniel realized by the, by the scrolls that the time was at hand and that God would send the people back but it also required public repentance before God was going to have anything to do with restoration. The beautiful, beautiful prayer of Daniel. If you take the time to look it up and read it. Daniel stands before God and prays a contrite and broken-hearted prayer as he confesses on his own behalf and the sins of the people that the reason why we're in captivity is because of what we have done. And the beautiful, beautiful prayer that Daniel prays is the one that sets in motion their restoration. Because the Bible says, even as Daniel prayed, an angel was sent from heaven with a message that there was that the decree was being sent from God that my people are going to go back. And the idea of restoration came about because there were people who cared, and because there were people who repented, and because there were people who tried to do God's work. Now let me tell you something. I've been talking about the church. Let's get down to the individual level. And when you have your problems, and when you go astray from God, that all can come back to you. When you find yourself having difficulty with God, it's not God who moved off and left you. We move off and left God. And the way that for me as an individual is like Ezra here, like Daniel, to recognize that I need to pray to God about my problems, and I need to care about my problems. And I need to pray to God to cleanse me and make things right again. Not the way that I'm going to be restored as an individual. We need to see very clearly that that's the case. Well, what happened then with regard to Ezra is that he found a solution for these matters. And I'm going to turn back to chapter 7 of Ezra's book and notice exactly what is so good for him and so good for us. In chapter 7, verse 10, For Ezra had set his heart to seek the law of Jehovah and to do it. And the teach of Israel statutes and ordinances. That could be preached every day, and I don't think we'd come up with that something. The idea that Ezra had, first of all, set his heart. Ezra wanted to do right. Not only that, he had a commitment that he made. You know, until you make that kind of commitment, you can never obey the gospel or start with it. And I believe if you're going to ever be a servant of God in all the church, this is the kind of commitment you've got to have. You've got to set your heart to be right. Good people, you don't become a Christian accidentally. And you don't stay a Christian accidentally. You're not going to go to heaven accidentally. You're not going to stumble that way. You've got to decide, I want to go to heaven. And I'll have to set my heart to go to heaven and determine that it's going to be that way. That's the way Ezra was. He set his heart to seek the law of Jehovah, and to do it. Now, first of all, he wanted to be right with God. He wanted to find out the law of God. And then he made his mind, I'm going to do it. Then after he made up the mind for himself, 
Then he put himself in a situation where he could teach others the same sort of thing. If this church is to grow and to have a fruitful future, my brethren, it's because you do what Ezra decided to do. Men and women, boys and girls, you have to set your heart to do what God wants you to do. You've got to seek after the law of God. You've got a desire to do it, make your mind you're going to do it, and then you're going to teach others about it. That's going to ensure the future of this church. And that's the only thing that's going to ensure, ensure the future of this church. <clears throat> now then, he made some applications of that. First of all, he made some applications of that as far as the priesthood was concerned. Ezra was called a Levi scribe, and he was also a priest of God. As a priest of God, he had to do the sacrifices. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter uh, chapter 2 and verse 5 that we are priests of God. And I believe that has to be an understanding that when things are wrong, as a priest of God, we set our heart to put things right. If I'm going to recognize my relationship to God, I must recognize that I'm a priest. And when I offer to God my worship and my service, I don't go to the pulpit throne, and I don't go to the clergy system. Listen to me. When you pray a prayer, you address the throne of God as a priest. No, you don't have the roles. No, it's not necessary to have some kind of a clergy system. But you go to God in prayer as a priest. When you take the Lord's Supper, when you do your good deeds, when you worship God in the assemblies, and when you worship God at home in private, you're appearing before God as a, as a priest of God. And therefore we have to purify ourselves. And that's what Ezra began to do as he came down to try to purify the people. He acted as a priest to purify the people. Not only was that so, but he recognized that he was a leader of the people. The Bible tells us that he brought somewhere about 1,700 people back to Jerusalem and led them back into the land and then was a leader in trying to get the people of God back to doing right. How bad do we need leaders today? And I'm going to come back again to the subject of elders. We're, we're having a family as so far as the elders are concerned. I don't know how many churches that I know that have been in existence about 40 years that do not have elders today. And I don't have a magic wand that I'm going to wait around and make some three elders. Nobody else does. But one of the reasons that I think I can put my finger on the problems in the church is because we don't have a lot of men who are qualified as elders. Now, there's a story behind that sometimes, too. And the reason why we don't have sometimes have godly elders is because we don't have godly elders' wives. And the reason why we don't have godly elders is sometimes because we don't have godly elders' children. And sometimes the wives that's qualified women. And sometimes the children disqualify man. And sometimes the man disqualifies himself. We need leaders of God's people. I'm not talking about some dictator. I'm not talking about a pastor system. I am so happy with God's way. I think God's way works. I fully believe that the system that God incorporated in the scriptures that describes elders in every church is the very best way that you can get the church popular. But the reason why we don't have more leaders is because we're not coming to the front with our hearts and our lives and giving ourselves to God. I want to say to the young men that are here tonight, you plan your life as much as possible within God's keeping. You plan your life to be an elder. The young girls that are here, you think in terms of what the Bible talks about an elder's wife should be. And as you rear your children, you think in terms of how those children will be in subjection. And you're using your discipline in the home to make those children be in subjection and to lead them away God would have them to go so that you can demonstrate godliness in the home. And you can demonstrate the ability to lead God's people. The reason why we have so many nutty people in the Church of Christ today with nutty ideas is because we don't have leaders. And anybody can come into a business meeting and bring up a nutty idea and they don't have the godly men to try to show them how wrong that is. Now, this is just an illustration that came out of history again. When the division came up in the, in the ranks of the church over the instrument music, uh, I don't recall all the details of the story, but there was a, 
There was a time where the church was faced with this one congregation with whether or not they're going to have an instrument of music for the worship service. And finally, because they couldn't agree, they decided to take a vote. Now, I don't like voting either. Uh, it just goes against everything I understand the Bible teaches. Now, yeah, voting, yeah. some people vote. And the process of voting on the hand has been a gospel preacher for many years. Voted against the instrument. His understanding of the Bible, his experience as a preacher, everything that he knew said it was unscriptural. But a young girl in the church, a recent convert, voted for the instrument. And that young girl who knew nothing at all about the Word of God, who knew nothing at all about the reasons why they ought not have the instrument, her vote canceled out the vote of that preacher, of that preacher who spent his life in service to God and knew that it was wrong. We need leaders. We need men who are qualified, men who have given themselves and their lives to serve God. And because you have lived a righteous life, and because you've qualified yourself by your love of the truth, and because you want to be a servant, not, not an overseer, not a master, not one who tries to round off the church, but because you want to be a servant in the kingdom of God. Because of all those things, you just rise to the top as a man qualified to be an elder. Ezra came along at a time where leaders were needed. And I'm telling you, the church of Jesus Christ in our time needs leaders. And unless we have men and young boys and young girls, who learn this and somehow prepare themselves to serve God in those capacities, the next 40 years is going to find the same problem once again and that we don't have qualified people to be elders. I don't think I, I can say that in this meeting. It's more important what I'm saying now. I don't believe there's a subject I can talk about more important than that. We need godly men and women who are going to lead the people of God the way they ought to go. Now, I, I don't think it's just an accident that Jesus talked about people being sheep. The Lord lifted his eyes and looked at Jews on one occasion, and they were all like sheep that had gone astray, not having a shepherd. And I believe that there's a reason why God refers to people as sheep, because sometimes we're just so dumb, and we're just led about where everybody wants to lead us. And we need, first of all, a confidence in the Bible. But we need these men who are dedicated to leading God's people and doing good things and the way they ought to go. Ezra was a man of his day. He was a leader. As a scribe, the Bible says he was a ready scribe. A man who handled the Word of God. A man who was familiar with the Word of God. There was a time when even people out in the denominational world referred to members of the Church of Christ as walking by. I don't ever hear that anymore. I don't hear that anymore, and there's a reason why. Because we're not walking backwards. I can quote instances where denominational churches, the Methodist and Baptist church, would have a debate, and they would call that member of the Church of Christ to sit in as moderator because he knew the Bible. And that's not true anymore. Our young people do not know the Bible. Listen, I've taught teenage classes when I would feel so sad. The young people that couldn't even read. I'm talking about high school kids. They couldn't even read. I said to the class, and we'll see members of the church, have been a member of the church 35 years, and we'll come to the word propitiation, and they'll stumble over it and jump on past the wall. They don't know what it means, have no understanding of the concept of propitiation, and yet that is the blessing that God has given to us. By which the wrath of God against sin is satisfied, and members of the church couldn't tell you what propitiation means. And there are a lot of other salvation terms, justification, sanctification. Can you define those terms? Do you really know? I'm not talking about a dictionary definition. But I'm saying, do you know what justification means? And do you understand what sanctification means? And do you understand what gospel means and what doctrine means? And can you put those things into balance with one another? What's happening to us when we can tell you? Who's having whose baby on which soap opera? But we'll never crack a Bible here today. I'm telling you, we've got our whole priorities messed up. And when the people of God in Ezra's day had the problems that they had, here was a man who knew the Bible and knew what, knew what to do for that. 
Did you ever stop and wonder why in Matthew 4 when Jesus was being tempted that he quoted the scripture? Now I've seen write-ups of some of these movies like The Exorcist and, and here's this man confronted with an evil spirit. So he holds up the cross as a talisman against the devil. Or he'll hold up, or he'll make a sign of the cross, or he'll hold up a piece of the scripture as a talisman. The Bible is not a talisman. It is not something to be treated against superstitious nonsense. <clears throat> Jesus did not quote scripture because he wanted to ward off the devil by quoting something holy. The psalmist said, Thy word have I laid up in my heart that I sin not. Now please let that sink in. The reason why Jesus quoted scripture was because it was in his heart. And when he was tempted, he knew a scripture that helped him. He knew in his heart that he was not supposed to do what the devil wanted him to do. Did Jesus have the power to turn stones into bread? Why, absolutely. Could Jesus, under other circumstances, have done those things and done so without any problem? Of course he could have. But Jesus knew the old devil was trying to tempt him. And there was the word of God that was laid up in his heart that he called on that word and found the strength to overcome temptation. Now, every one of us, and this is true without exception, every one of us is going to have temptation and trials and problems in our life. Now, when you have those kind of problems, and I'm not, I'm not opposed to medicine, understand? But do you run to the pill bottle first, or do you run to the word of God? When your tears are being shed, bitter tears because of problems in your life, do you find comfort from the Psalms? Do you try to find comfort from the Word of God? Or do you have to go out and get a counselor? I'm not, I'm not opposed to counseling. But I'm saying the Word of God can do some things that no one else can do. I'm not opposed to marriage counselors. I understand. But when you begin to have problems in your marriage, do both of you as husband and wife Come together over the vital, the prayer, try to work out your problems the way God would have you to do it. Or do you run to some marriage counselor and say, well, go out and have an affair and enrich your life. I'm telling you the reason why Ezra was able to cause things to come together and help Israel is because he understood the principles of God's word and how they apply. And the Bible is not just some matter of a holy book that we lay on the shelf and sometimes it sort of waves in the air like it's a talisman or something to ward off superstition. The Bible has to be incorporated in the very heart of man for us to really understand it. And then he simply, as a restorer, set about doing those things that he ought to do in order to bring those people back together again. I want to close tonight by looking at Nehemiah chapter 8. Let's sort of wrap things up. Nehemiah chapter 8, beginning verse 1. Ezra and Nehemiah were two men of a kind. They had a different occupation, but they were two men of a kind. So, in Nehemiah 8, and verse 1, all the people gathered themselves together as one man in the broad place that was before the water gate. They spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which Jehovah had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all they could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the broad place that was before the water gate from early morning until midday. Do I hear brethren say that an hour sermon is too long? Do I hear brethren say that 45 minutes is too long? Well, they've been fussing to Nehemiah like you can't believe. That's right. They're, they're early morning until midday. In the presence of the men and the women and of those that could understand. And the ears of all the people were attended by the book of the law. What caused Ezra and Nehemiah to succeed in the restoration was the people opened up their hearts. They had receptive audience. In Acts chapter 2, what took place with regard to the beginning of the kingdom was placed because there was an active audience that was receptive. In Acts chapter 7, they stoned Stephen to death. And there's the difference in attitude. The reason why the people here were able to understand what was being said was because the ears of all the people were attentive under the book of the law. Down in verse 6, Ezra blessed Jehovah, the great God. And 
And all the people answered, Amen, and Amen, with the lifting up of their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped Jehovah with their faces to the ground. The latter part I'll pass over these names are difficult to pronounce. The Levites called the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. And they read in the book the law of God distinctly, and they gave the sense so that they understood the reading. And the restoration of the place. I believe in life, but that's what's going to have to happen to us. We've got to have all these things true to us. And when we turn to the Word of God and repentance, when we pray to God and get back on course, we won't go off in the field. We're not going to be bringing in some new novel ideas just for the sake of novelty. But we'll be doing God's way, and God, God's things in God's ways and be satisfied. And when someone tries to bring in something that's not right, we'll simply turn to the Word of God and suggest that that's not the way we're headed. It would not. We're so new congregation. We've only been there about eight years, and we have a lot of people come in. They want to do a lot of things. When we were building the building, we had, I don't have any time, we had salesmen come by. They tried to sell us gymnastic equipment, and they tried to sell us kitchen equipment, and they tried to sell us just any other thing. And I said, you don't understand. We're just a big church. And they scratched their head. They didn't they couldn't imagine a church that's just a church anymore. It was very strange to them. They, they hadn't talked about it. And that's just what we are. We're just a church. We're going to do God's things and God's works. I believe that's what you're trying to do. I said all that tonight, not because I think that you need a restoration tonight and that you've gone astray. I'm saying that there's always the danger and the apostasy that just happen and you jump 75 degrees off course. What happens is that we drift a degree and then we drift another degree. And we've left another degree. What the Bible teaches us is that we've got to come back constantly. There is a constant restoration <coughs> under, part, under uh, underway, a constant restoration of getting back to the way that God would have us to go. And when we have that kind of attitude, we'll always come back to what God wants us to do. It may be that some of the audience tonight that you come back as an individual. Maybe you've been drifting, drifting little by little, and don't realize it. Suddenly you find yourself. Not be what God would have you to do. Then let me encourage you tonight to have the attitude of Ezra. And have the attitude of Nehemiah. And come back to God. Come back all the way. Don't stop that part of it. Come back all the way.